In this episode of the Business of E-Commerce, I talk with Len Johnson about optimizing your post-purchase checkout flow. This is the Business of E-Commerce, episode 54. Welcome to the Business of E-Commerce, the show that helps e-commerce retailers start, launch, and grow the e-commerce business. I'm your host, Charles Pulesky, and I'm here today with Lance Johnson. Lance is a founder of Scale XL. I asked him on the show today to talk a bit more about how you can get more revenue by optimizing your post-purchase checkout flow. So, hey, Lance, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing well, Charles. Awesome. So glad to have you on the show today. Um, first, what is ScaleXL? I want to kind of get your background a little bit and how you got into this. Yeah, great question. So uh, ScaleXL is my newest venture. I've been uh, doing e-commerce consulting for, I guess, about 10 years now. Uh, I started because I was a broke college student. I ended up failing out of school and I needed to uh, find a new way to replace my scholarship. I got five younger brothers and my parents said, it's a great idea if you go to school, but we can't pay for it. So you, uh, you're going to need to figure something out. And I said, man, what can I do? And I'd done a little bit of web design in high school and somehow stumbled my way into digital marketing uh, and started off as a copywriter. So then one thing led to another, ended up founding a company with some guys and uh, realized that there's just a huge market in direct consumer uh, e-commerce offering. So I said, man, I'm going to keep doing this. Uh, took a year off and, and did a year of mission in Chile. I'm Catholic and uh, came back and de decided to get back in the game, did some more consulting for a, a survival product company. Uh, and now I'm looking to acquire some companies as well as offer a, a little bit of individualized consulting. Cool. Okay. So you're kind of using this in to do both on the um, optimization side, but also acquiring possibly other e-commerce businesses. Yeah. And I, I'd say with optimization, part of the idea too is looking at it and seeing, hey, are, are, is this person going to grow their company and then eventually want to exit their company? So uh, almost a way to make a win-win relationship that'll that'll mean potential deal flow five, 10 years down the road. Okay. And are you platform agnostic or is there a certain, um, you know, Shopify, a certain platform that you guys are, you know, looking for or only work with? Yeah, great question. So I think that uh, Shopify has some beautiful plugins, right? There's cart hook, which makes that post-purchase checkout flow a whole lot easier. Um, but big commerce has some plugins that work. I think one of our, our clients was very large. They were, you know, mid eight figures. They used a CRM that most people, you know, it was really big for the subscription market uh, called Limelight CRM. So then it, you know, it was very bespoke. Everything had to be custom coded, but we still could work with them just fine. So I'd say platform agnostic, but there are certain platforms that make life easier for sure. Okay. So when you talk about optimizing the post-purchase checker flow, post-purchase checkout flow. Sorry, a lot of... Uh, <laughs> a lot of P's. A lot of P's consecutively <laughs> there. <laughs> so when you talk about optimizing that, what uh, what exactly are we talking about? It's after the sale is made, then what? Yeah, great question. So there's two main pillars that I think of. Uh, first is the, the thank you page, right? So the immediate page that they're going to see right after entering their credit card information. So I think... Um, it really was was born out of necessity, like getting good at trying to increase revenue with with almost like foolproof bets. Because if you come in as a consultant, you know, they uh, may, maybe you have some tactics that have a high expected value, right? But only work 10% of the time. So it's still a smart decision. It might be that even the best decision. We'll just take like uh, trying to scale a Facebook ad campaign or some new creative idea. Like that could be one of the best things for the business, but it's going to take 10 swings to really find one that works well and uh, no client or you know even if you just acquired a business like you don't want to you don't want to have something with low expectancy right you don't want to have something that has a high chance of failing so that's really where when I when I sat down and said geez if I only had uh, one test to run if I can only change one thing about the business where would it be what I got to was really the post purchase checkout flows um, and so the first one is the thank you page and the second one is the email sequence. Um, just, and you can really, you can say email, Facebook messenger, whatever you, if you have them in a group, but things that, um, one, don't change your conversion rate beforehand, right? We'll, we'll even add something like a, a small revenue bump that might be on the checkout page. 
uh, that you don't know what it's going to do to conversions. Like my, the likelihood of it hurting conversions isn't that high, but it could happen, right? Versus if you have something that's post-purchase, there's it's going to have zero impact on what your conversion rate looks like and and how many um, how many buyers you get with the same amount of traffic. The yeah. Okay, so you're talking about everything. Basically, everything that happens after the purchase can, can affect the rate of that purchase, right? Because by definition, it's happening after. So you kind of look at, fo you focus on um, that because mo unless you start talking about like repeat buyers, um, there's nothing you can really do to make it worse. So it's only up from there, basically. You nailed it. Yes. It, it's like, I like uh, to find games that I have a very low chance of losing, right? When I, I don't play poker because I'm not any good at poker. I don't want to get good at poker. And I know that the odds of me losing are almost 100, right? And um, there's just a lot of opportunities. So I think we only want to swing at pitches that are really fat pitches that come across the plate and we say, you know, I know we can increase um, the results there. And part of it is because we do a lot based on performance. Um, just, you know, I have another agency that I own that does more B2B marketing and uh, everybody hires consultants, right? And, and consultants work or they don't work or everyone, you know, wants to find another partner to acquire a new business or maybe they, they're an LP who's looking for a GP to work with, like, Everybody knows that uh, losing money is no fun and that there are just too many ways to do it. And there's a lot of big promises. So since I, I always have skin in the game with projects I work on, I also want to do something that's going to move the needle pretty much instantly. Yep. Gotcha. So out of those two, either the thank, out the thank you page or the, e or the emails, and you're talking about emails they get basically, hey, you know, your order's complete. Um, and sometimes you just get, hey, your order's complete. Uh, we'll send you a tracking number and that's it. But then sometimes you get other folks that have something more complicated. So where would you start out of those two? So when just looking in terms of percentages, uh, so many people are going to see that thank you page, right? It's it's going to be nearly 100% of people that are going to see the thank you page that bought. Some people might do something really weird and close out instantly. Um, I mean, it, it could happen, but odds are good that your highest percentage of viewers are going to be looking at that immediate thank you page. Uh, and the other other thing that the direct mail guys talk about is uh, RFM, which is recency, frequency, and monetary value. So you don't get in that, you know, you want those three items to be as high as possible. You don't get any more recent than somebody who just finished putting in their credit card number and clicking yes. So I would hands down focus on, you know, instant upsell right after. Some people call them cross sells, but then the thank you page offer um, and really funnel of offers. I would I would posit that, you know, there's a tension between irritating your new customer. You don't want to burn the bridge, but I think you can also bring them in in a way that just says, like, nobody's mad at McDonald's when you say I want a cheeseburger and they say, do you want fries with that? Like people, people don't get frustrated. And oftentimes they say, yeah, actually, I do want fries with that. And wow, I hadn't thought about it. And, you know, or your cashier says, it's actually cheaper. Chick-fil-A does this to me all the time. It's actually cheaper if you get a drink or if you get the combo because you're getting a sandwich and a drink. So you're, you're, it's kind of like you're getting free fries. So the, I think that the customer is happy if we can show them how you could get a better deal if you go ahead and take this extra offer uh, and, and wh however the better deal works, or maybe it's a limited time offer or something. Well, and it's one of those things, right? If, you know, I'm in the toy store buying a toy for my son and I'm ready to leave and the uh, cashier says, did you know that doesn't come with batteries? There's that moment where either you say, yes, I, you know, have them at home or you go, oh, re oh, let me grab, and you grab those right in there, right sitting at the end cap. And that's that moment you don't care. You, you actually like are happy there, you know, stopping you for a minute and saying, did you know, by the way, that doesn't have batteries? If you want, they're right there. Let's grab them um, or not. Yeah. And you can take it or leave it. Exactly. Yeah, there's always a no thanks. And I think that the, you know, to go with the analogy that maybe the difference between McDonald's and um, a lot of the things we've seen have success is just the, we'll just think in terms of percentages of uh, take rates, right? So at McDonald's, I don't know what the percentage of people that take fries and drinks are. Um, those are two very high profit margin offers, right? Especially drinks. So, and I would guess that since it's pretty low ticket in comparison to the original item they bought, um, then they get a high take rate. Like there's a lot of people that say, yeah, I'd like fries and drink. Um, in contrast with the post-purchase upsells, you know, where on that thank you page where you make a new offer, um, you really have some flexibility in deciding what works best with your market, right? I've, um, there are the free plus shipping funnels where maybe you paid 
nine bucks for shipping and um, got a, a twenty dollar product for free. And you know, you came in. Well, we've seen it where you offer a product that's two thousand dollars, right? And sure, it's going to be a low take rate, maybe a a two percent take rate, but you can do the math on average order value, right? If you if you just say our cogs were fifty percent, so it's a thousand bucks, so you got twenty bucks out of a sale that was nine dollars. Uh, so your average order value, and we're talking with gross profit, is now you know. But let's imagine you had to lose three bucks on it. You got a seventy dollar average order value for a product that you sold for nine dollars. So and the best part is it didn't cost you anything to make that offer, right? So and it didn't cost you anything. Yeah. Yeah. So it's nothing. You know, there's nothing that you already acquired the customer. They're already there. You've already purchased from you. Yeah. And now it quite literally is an upsell. Um, there's no extra. Um, there's no extra money you need to put in. It. Even time, you know, you set it up, but there's no extra like thing that needs to be done at that point. It just you can make them the offer and take it or leave it. And if there's any percentage bump, like you said, that's a win. Yeah. Well, and, and to give some context, like I think that with a, a fully dialed in upsell flow, you know, if you if you're making at least two offers, right, I would expect 30 percent to 50 percent of the revenue on your on the product funnel. Right. We'll just imagine that you have a flagship product uh, or you even set up flows for a couple of different products that your best sellers, then you can you know, you can add 30 to 50 percent of revenue just by having a dialed in upsell flow. So it's not a negligible amount of revenue either. And what was that percentage again? 30 to 50%. 30 to 50. So yeah, I've heard that a couple of times. Yeah, I'm always yeah. shocked, but uh, that number always seems shockingly high. And that's yeah. not the first time I've heard it. And it's always just like, like unbelievable. <laughs> like, and when you say two step, are we talking, make them an offer and they can say no. And then li quite literally make them a second offer. Yeah. So I'm thinking that, um, this is where you have to decide what the customer experience is, is going to be best as, but, uh, it would be like, Hey, you know, you come in and, um, we'll taste, we'll just take McDonald's again as our analogy, uh, or we'll do that free plus shipping. So you come in and you say yes to the $9 product. Maybe I'll offer you a $300 product. You say, no, I say, well, how about if you take this $300 product in payments, right? What if we do an installment plan? Um, and I mean, you could switch it. You could do the upfront. Uh, installment plan and then offer then when they say yes to the installment plan they get another offer that says hey i know you took the installment plan um why don't we decrease the total amount if you pay today and so instead of paying 300 dollars, you'd pay 250 dollars today it saves you one payment and it's good for you on a cash flow basis um because you get the money today so you don't have to you're, you're going to have to front the money for the inventory anyway and so then you can pay that off quicker hmm. how do people actually technically implement that because i feel like the backend logic of kind of that deferred payment, um, like who does that and how? Great question. So it, this is going to be very specific to the product um, or to the CRM that you're working with, right? If you're on Shopify or if you're on Limelight or if you're on BigCommerce, whatever. But uh, it, it's basically going to be set up as separate orders. Okay. So cart hook, I'm trying to remember how, I, I don't remember their process on it, but we'll just, I'll give you the two most common scenarios. Uh, one is that you batch all the transactions. Okay, so there's a session that's opened up when someone places an initial order. And then at the end of the session, let's say that you said yes to two things and no to three things. So um, you've got your whole order and it's going to place the, it's going to do one transaction and send you a receipt for that one transaction. The other way that I think is more common is you'll have the initial transaction, right? And you get a receipt email for that. Then you have, the second one, uh, you say yes, you get another receipt email for that. And you have the third one, you get a receipt email from that. And so if it was a subscription, then what it would do, you could, let's just imagine you're using Chargeify, it would be a subscription or in Stripe, you can go in and set payments, number of payments. And so uh, you could say, all right, we're doing a five payments of $99.95. And so it just enables that subscription, um, just as if you were selling an individual product. And it's just it's essentially creating three separate orders in the uh, shopping cart. So versus the other way sounds a little more, um, you know, depending on shopping cart by shop, if, if they can even do it on like batching them together and then actually processing payment once. Because there's also that separation with the credit card if you're actually doing like an auth and then capture. Um, so you'd have to like defer the capture. You have to defer the capture until after the last, um, basically until you really know. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm done. I don't want it anymore. <laughs> and, and then, okay, now I really believe you. Okay. Yeah. No, what I've, what I've really seen it normally is that you just process it as separate transactions. 
And, uh, and most people will set it up as a one click transaction as well. So then you say, Hey, do you want to add this to your order? Click here. It's just like Amazon's one click. Um, you, you have to be really clear on the button that, so people know that they're going to be, you know, they're going to be charged when they click the button. Um, and you know, you can use verbiage like, yes, charge my card an additional $49 or whatever. And, uh, and it, but you know, customers are, customers are generally happy if they wanted the item, right? Because it, I don't know how you are about your credit card number. I fortunately or unfortunately have one of my credit cards memorized because I've just, I guess I've just bought a lot of stuff. It's like you need, uh, you need online shoppers anonymous when you memorize your credit card number. Yeah. I've tried buying stuff. <laughs> you try buying stuff on your phone and you're like, uh, it was like, don't, I just don't want this thing anymore. If I have to <laughs> type it into my phone. So I started you're using, like, oh, not, not a plug for one pass, but I started using them one password. And it, that's the one thing that makes this a lot easier. You have them all right there and, you you can go right down, but that's another story. So, but if you want to buy on your phone, use One Pass. There you go. And so I think that for the consumer, right, they already put out their credit card, and uh, and so much of like mobile traffic. I don't know what your percentage of mobile traffic are, but you know, our last client they have seventy percent mobile or something like that. It was, it was just an absurd number of mobile purchases. And and people on mobile will buy high ticket products, will buy low ticket products. It's not like I I've heard that um, idea that like you educate on mobile. And then you push for a purchase, you retarget on desktop. And I just haven't seen that to be the case where I'm, I'm sure that there's a place for education on mobile and people consume content differently. But man, people flat out buy on mobile as well. I, I feel like that was the case a few years back. You know, if we go years ago, like 2014, 15, when mobile was still like coming up a little more, when it wasn't like that normal. But there's people now who I think they just use a mobile, like they might not necessarily even have a desktop or even get in front of a PC every day. Um, that might just be how they buy online period. So it's not, they're not going to, you're not going to educate them that they're going to go to something else. There is no something else. That's where they're going to, that's where they do their transaction. <laughs> yeah, you nailed it. And I, I would also take a step back and say, while I, I really like working on post-purchase flows, that's um, one of the first things I would always check is just like, pulling out my phone and seeing what a website looks like in the checkout flow, especially, right? Everything, the further away you get from the checkout flow, the more risky your, your uh, optimization is going to be. But the, I mean, geez, so many people are trying to check out on, uh, well, and Shopify is pretty good about this, but some of the other platforms that maybe have themes that don't update as frequently, you'll see some checkout flows that just are awful. And the, I mean, especially on mobile, they can be bad on desktop, but really awful on mobile. So that's the only probably pre-checkout optimization I would start with if it's just so bad that um, they could use a lot of love. Yep. Yeah. Just so just run through it yourself on your own mobile and just have a, you know, do the do the squint test where you reach out and kind of look and see, you know, does everything line up? Does it make sense? Um, I've done it before where there was some sort of pop up that happened making an offer, but on the mobile, you couldn't see behind it and you couldn't get to like the x so it was like there is so if this per, if this site had ever looked at their checkout rates there's like a zero percent checkout rate on an iphone just because you can't get to you can't ever get past this dialogue and it was just okay i have to go i, I have to go get a laptop basically if i want to buy from you um it's so stuff like that that you know that no one's ha has ever gone through this flow um so that's definitely a good tip yeah, and I would say as a potential investor, I'm thrilled to see some of those things, right? Where I'm like, yes, zero percent checkout rate on mobile, like something's broken. Low hanging fruit. You know, yeah, exactly. Like there's, I don't like, uh, you know, as I look for properties invested, I don't, I don't look for things that take somebody smart to optimize. I'm looking for things that are just really brain dead simple and that are pretty guaranteed revenue generators. Well, that's probably probably why it sounds like you've focus on the post purchase, right? Where, you know, if you come in, you know, whatever the rate is now, you can, you can make it go higher. Um, and like you said, it might be 30 to 50%. Like if, if that's your number, you know, day one come in and it's you're going to improve. Yeah. Nice. So then you also mentioned emails. Um, so now clearly you're talking about going above and beyond the thank you for your order. Um, it'll ship in five to seven days. See, so <laughs> have, have a good time. Bye. So going beyond that email, Definitely. Okay. So I think that, uh, you know, another, it, it, this is going to depend a whole lot on what your cash flow situation is. But uh, I usually imagine that a, a whole lot of the value of a customer is going to come in their first 90 days. And again, we'll go back to that recency, frequency, and monetary value. 
So if I have, a, if you don't have an, another offering, right? Let's just imagine you're a, a single product brand and you have one sales funnel or you have one e-commerce page. This probably isn't going to apply as much, although you can always offer more in terms of quantity. Um, you know, if they like it, you say, well, they just bought one. What do they need another one for? You're like, this is the perfect time to ask. The closer to that initial purchase, then the better it is to ask them to buy again. But you definitely need your transactional emails, right? So you're thank you for ordering, here's your tracking number, those kinds of things. But the next step is to really bring them into a conversation with your brand. And so I'm not saying like conversation like, hey, I want to know exactly, um, you know, what your your hopes and dreams outside of this niche are, but helping them to get familiar with hearing from you on a regular basis. And so always think of it as like a 90 day sequence that shows them our best offerings, shows them the um, you know, best ways to interact with us, right? So you can do some really helpful things by, I heard a great tip from, um, oh, it was Sully from Bomb Tech Golf, where he was, he was talking about just the importance of sending out a question email, right? I think he was saying that email number two for him, which we're totally gonna swipe, is just question, and then it has a question mark, and it asks a, a really simple question. So it gets people feeling uh, like they wanna interact with the brand, but it also moves, if you're on Gmail, which like there's a good percentage of market that's probably on Gmail, even if it's the seniors, like we've marketed to seniors and, and Gmail is just really a large uh, player. And so you want to be in that primary tab, right? As soon as you're in the social or promotions tab, like you're going to see open rates go down. And so if people respond to your emails, um, you can definitely get a better chance of being in the primary tab. And on top of that, just like educating them on how you'd like them to interact with your emails and saying, could you drag my email from the social tab or whatever tab you saw it in to the primary tab? That should be pretty early on in the sequence um, because it'll just it'll be a cascading effect that really impacts all the emails you send. Uh, so I think that that initial 90 days is where I go. If you're sending three emails, that's another big revenue boost that we know we can walk in and get without a whole ton of risk. And is that three though? So three over the first 90 days. So you're talking 30, 60, 90, or like, is so there something else? I'm saying if you're only sending three emails, when we walk in over that first 90 days, then it's just another big low hanging fruit place because, gotcha. okay. yeah, cause there's, so I would say like the first week, it might be multiple emails. Maybe we'll send out three emails in the first week. And one is going to be that question email. One is going to be um, another promotion like, Hey, thanks for buying. They didn't take, let's imagine they didn't take one of the upsells. Right. And, and again, so 20 to 30% of your revenue might come from upsells, but that's not because everybody's taking it. That's because there's a few hyper responders. So maybe only 10 to 30% of all the people that come through the post-purchase flow are actually going to take you up on that upsell offer. So that means you got 70 to 80% that you can follow up with and say, Hey, look, uh, I really like honest deadlines. I'm not a big fan of false scarcity. So it's there's some marketers that say, well, you know, it's uh, I don't actually know what rationalization they use, but there's just I don't like that idea of false scarcity. So if there's any way that you can build in new customer only discounts and you can right? You say, look, I like to do this for my new customers for the for the next seven days. You can get that thing I offered you not at as good of a price as you got it in the post purchase upsell flow but it's still better than what it normally sells at. You can go to our website and see the normal price. And if you don't buy it within the next seven days, no problem, but you lose that price. Um, it's funny, I've, I've done that. And then like six months later, you get someone forward you that exact email and go, all right, I'm ready now for that price. <laughs> <laughs> okay. like, all right, fine, you can, you can still have it, but it wasn't real, you know, it was false scarcity, but sure. Um, <laughs> so I guess it still actually serves a purpose, but you might not be able to force them to do it over, uh, you know, that first week, but they do at least say, oh, I have this coupon now that pretty much works indefinitely. So I've seen well, that. Well, we've, we've told people no, right? Oh, really? Or they say, yeah, they say, well, I'd like to buy it at the price. And I say, sorry, you know, this is, it was for that timeline. Like if you look at the email, it says it was seven days and uh, we're at like day 312. Like, sorry, man, you can't get it. And, um, and so I, I think that the, you know, no, if somebody was really mad about it or maybe wanted to sue us, I don't know what I would do. But the, <laughs> but in normal situations, I think that it's uh, it's probably OK. Like a customer knows if they miss a sale at Target because it said coupon expires 12, 31, 2018, they, they know they can't bring that coupon in. Um, and so I, I think a lot of them are OK with it in general when, when 
they don't get to, you know, have that coupon work for them still. Got it. So then let's say over the first 30, 60, 90 days. So let's say three in the first week, but how many in total are we looking at in this sequence? Like how far, how, how far would you push this? Yeah, good question. So it depends a lot on um, how many offers you have, how many partners you have that you can make offers for, I mean, what the what the like level of content available is for the brand. Because what I don't want to do is slam folks with offer, 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 right? Like you could just think of that as like a churn and burn. And it doesn't matter how strong, like if Apple sent me an email every day or I think it was probably 2014 and partnered with some guys and it was like, I realized that you can send people five emails a day and like you could just get that, that revenue that much faster. It's like you can until they unsubscribe. And I mean, there are people who like, well, co-reg, I don't, I don't work in the supplement space, but I think it probably, when I've talked to some of the guys, there's some really ethical supplement folks and there's some guys in supplement space or info product space that probably have a different idea of like what they want their customer experience to be. Um, so that's one extreme, right? You could send five emails a day for 90 days and then there were folks who did it and, uh, I was shocked, but you know, yep. uh, so the flip side of that is, um, I don't think you need to send, some people are really afraid to send more than an email a week, right? They're like, well, what if they don't want to hear from me? Because I don't think as humans, we're really good at thinking in power laws, right? We think really well linearly and we don't think really well in power laws. And so there is, there's Richard Koff, he wrote this book, The 80-20 Principle, which I've had all your listeners know about. And then Perry Marshall has 80-20 Marketing. Um, and the thing that convicts me on a regular basis is best buyers want to buy more. And, it, and not in the sense that like I have to force these folks to buy more, but like they are actively waiting and looking for more offers. Uh, I would probably fall in that category for like private equity podcasts, right? Like I don't, it wasn't like, oh, I listened to a private equity podcast, so I don't need to listen anymore, right? I I actively search or I liked the guy's uh, interview, so I listened to it and I'm going to listen to five more that the same person did. Uh, and, you know, we all know that kind of mini obsessive behavior and our customers are the same way, right? Now, I think that it's important to, if they ask you to stop sending them stuff or decrease the rate or they're not opening, which is really, I think, another way of somebody asking you to do something, right? Like if if you and I are having a conversation and you shut down and I keep talking at you, then it, it's not really a conversation anymore. Yeah. Uh, and it's the same way with a customer. But for the folks that are responding well and, and you have solid open rates on it, I would say they, they want to keep hearing from you. So to get really specific, I would look at a minimum of two update kind of emails per week. So if you can have content that's very relevant, um, we'll just, you know, imagine that we're in I'm trying to think of a, a good client. Well, we'll just say golf, right? If, if you're in, uh, if you bought golf drivers, uh, then there's probably multiple topics that you're interested in that don't necessarily relate to the product, but I can make a plug for another product in just like a space ad format. So you know, maybe I, I have a content writer put together something on the mental game of golf, right? It could go over, uh, there was a guy who wrote the, the inner game of tennis. And then there's, you know, you could just talk about like, Hey, here are the, the mind hacks that golfers, the best golfers use. Uh, and inside that email, like you have a space ad, I would bet you money that nobody on your list is mad about either the space ad nor the email. Um, and it's definitely going to generate like some people are going to buy from that space ad. Yeah. And it's one of those things. If I know hobbies, I have like that. Mm -hmm. I actually kind of look forward to those emails and then yeah. maybe I'll, even if I don't purchase them for another six months, I'm still always kind of looking and saying like, maybe I will today. Like, you know, if there's anything with like an equipment based hobby, golf's a perfect example where you are constantly kind of like upping your equipment. Um, you can, you can send more and people don't hate that. Unless it's, you know, unless you bought it as a gift for someone, but they're going to unsubscribe after the first one because they're, they're one time, they're different. But the person that actually bought for themselves, they might be on that list for literal years and just look at each email, kind of look forward to it and even kind of browse through. Um, and I've done this even personally. You browse through at the latest equipment and just kind of look at it and you're planning your next set of drivers. It could be a year from now, two years from now, but you open it each time and you read through them. Yeah, that's exactly right. So I think that, you know, if you're going to go with a real minimum sequence, 
then you have two emails per week that are very content based with a space ad. And then one that just lets people know maybe you have something new, but it's it's explicitly product related, right? So you say, hey, we've got, um, and this could be a time bound thing. Hey, uh, again, thanks for being a new customer. You know, week one, this thing's going to expire. And it's got maybe a couple emails that leads into it. Just want to remind you this expires. So they can be super short and very simple. Uh, then another step, though, would be like setting up a special sale, uh, some kind of bundle sale that happens after the first 14 days. And that sale has, it's like a mini launch, right? So it has uh, a few emails that are going to support it. Maybe you have five or six emails that support it and let them know when it's opening, when it's closing. And you can set up sequences. So it's an authentic scarcity again, but that it, they only have access to it for limited time. And so the, the cool thing about it is you've got real deadlines. Uh, and you have a reason to email them that is true and, and is really going to hold up. Uh, but then you just take it off the table and you move on and you go back to your content emails. And so I would say if you do for every th four weeks of email, you do one week of mini launch, uh, then you're probably in good shape. So you can alternate that content plus like everybody knows that if I'm subscribed to a list that's for a store that they're going to sell me something once in a while. And you can take non-openers out or you can like how you treat non-openers is really going to be a big deal for deliverability, but it's up to you. Right. And it's, and it's not going to hurt um, what you have going on existing because it's a post purchase kind of flow. And I've seen before, I think there's a way to actually do this inside that, um, you know, it's called, like a, a drip campaign, something kind of, that's like always sent out inside that drip campaign to pull in, here's the latest sales from our shopping cart. Um, and it's dynamic. So whatever, so there might be a top five sales, top three, and you pull those in on the, you know, third email, second email and say, here's our latest sales. And that's actually like changing. And it's not like a false scarcity. That's quite literally what's selling on live right now. Um, you're just kind of putting it top of mind and in a week, it's going to be something different. So whoever subscribes today gets one version of that and a week from now gets a different version. So I think there's ways of doing that, of making your drip campaign, um, you know, pre-scripted, but pulling from a dynamic place. Integrations are a beautiful thing. Yeah. There's just some powerful stuff that you can do. Yeah. So you nailed it. And I, and something like that, um, the thing I've always loved about these drip campaigns is it's not like that, you know, monthly newsletter where you have to sit down every month and all right, what, what content do we have to put together? And you have to design it each month and kind of get it all together. Once you build these campaigns, that's it. You're done. Um, and if you can pull in dynamic content, all the better, but the, even if you can't, even if it's just static, if it's a first time user and you're able to, um, tell, Hey, this is the first time this person went through the checkout flow, you send them this campaign. It's always that person's first time seeing this. So even if you've read through this a hundred times, it's new to them each time. And that's the neat thing that, you know, you start thinking like, uh, you know, do I have to do something new, but you really don't have to, because you're only sending it to new users that this is the first time they're seeing it. So it's, you can optimize, but you don't really need to change it unless you find a reason to optimize. You nailed it. And honestly, I mean, we have clients that have used the same flow for a couple of years where they went, oh, wow. And I mean, maybe they had to switch out products. But like you said, if you're dynamically importing the products anyway, uh, then you don't even, you don't even need to do that. But it's really, if I walked in and I saw somebody that had a great 90 day sequence, I probably wouldn't mess with it, right? If Because the optimization, like what you're going to get out of it is, is probably going to be minor. You're, you're probably not going to hit any home runs uh, if somebody already has it. These are these are best if somebody sends out um, just a newsletter, right? Maybe they have a rich text newsletter, an HTML newsletter. And that's where I would get really excited. Like, hey, guys, there's some money on the table. Let's do these plain text email sequences that people really like getting. Or, you know, let's try some there, so... Yeah, it's, it's it's funny when people um when you talk optimizations, everyone has that example of how Google changed like the button color slightly, and you know they had like a hundred variations of blue and all these things, and you and they got this like they give like the percentage it increased it and you know but what that actually meant to their revenue, but then you realize, but then everyone kind of forgets like, but you're not Google, so like trying to <laughs> you know like a like a one hundredth of a percent doesn't actually do anything for you, so going from not having it to having it is where you get like 98% of the gains going from like the color of the button, unless you're Google, Amazon, you know, someone like that, 
you're not going to, that's not going to start moving the needle. So you need to look for, like you said, these opportunities where people haven't even, haven't even touched this yet, haven't even tried. Yeah. And I would say that's the real opportunity of having these smaller enterprises, right? Like if you have, and I would argue that if you have anybody that's at under a hundred million dollars a year in revenue, they probably feel like there's more things to do than they have time. Right. And they, they probably feel like, man, we could be doing such a better job and give you a laundry list of what they would consider low hanging fruit as well. That could really move the needle. Uh, when you get down to a store owner that has a you know $5 million a year, even $500,000 a year uh, business, like they've got a lot of hats they're wearing and they're just like, they're just struggling to make things keep working at a high level. Like they know about some of these opportunities, but just haven't had a chance to do them. So optimization, I think, I like optimization. You know, I like uh, <laughs> there's just some really good tools that because you mentioned that hundredth or thousandth of a percent, man, most of our data collection isn't even going to be accurate to that level. Yeah. Right. Like yeah, it can be falsely precise where it looks like this is, you know, we are confident in this. And, uh, and but your confidence interval, you know, it goes to six sigma or it goes to a three sigma or whatever. But you're tracking only it has a 10 percent tolerance, right, depending on where you're at. So you could have noise that dictates the winner if you have under that threshold. Um, so uh, to your point, optimization makes sense if you are already at a large scale, but sometimes it's like a binary thing. Can we scale this offer or not? And a 10% increase in revenue is great, but it's probably not going to be the deal breaker. Like We really need to look for those 30 to 40 to 50. We, we need to add revenue in pretty big ways if you want to be able to change a, a million dollar a year business fundamentally, or you grow it pretty substantially. Have you seen a business where doing anything kind of post-purchase doesn't make sense? It doesn't kind of fit or it doesn't like, doesn't work. Um, I'm trying to think, is there an example where the price points too low or let's say you have all products that are of the same price point. So maybe you have a, a t-shirt business where, um, you know, every product is nine 99 or whatever it is. Is there a point where it doesn't make sense to do this or there's not like a, a good set of offers or is yeah, it something you can always kind of figure something out? It's a great question. So I would say that uh, the, the main place that I see it is when you leave the self-serve transaction model and you move into the uh, kind of bespoke or like an agency model, right? When, whenever you're selling something, uh, even if you have to go to a competitor and say, look, we want to sell your product on the site because it's a great add-on or, or whatever the case might be. I think that you know, from we've done post-purchase upsells from anywhere to a $5 product uh, to like a $2,000 product. So it really goes up and down the spectrum pretty well. Um, and the ratio, like you can just expect that if you get way outside of it, the take rate is going to be much lower or it's not going to make a difference for your product. But when you're, when you're negotiating a contract and let's say it's a fifty dollars or $100,000 contract, that, you know, anything that's going to require a purchase order to be generated and it's hard to pay after the terms were set. Yeah. So if you were a homes, if, if you sold something like real estate or you sold something like, um, I don't know, boats, possibly like where you you really have uh, a price that was negotiated and then finalized. And then like I cut you a big check or I got financing for then that would be a bad time to use it. Um, you need a boss to sign off or something. They do it like B2B where you're basically, uh, you know, ha like you said, have to like, you're almost making like a deal at that point. And then, okay, this is a deal. Let's move forward. Um, I've even seen, we worked with a customer that did uh, sold flooring, like like uh, tile floors. And at that point it was like, there's not, you know, it was like the shipment was like a ton, like literal measured in like tons and it came in like a, a forklift and that sort of thing. So it was a little bit of a different, it wasn't just a standard like, you know, hey, want to buy some extra floors? Like it was, it was a little different. So I guess in those little businesses, that's probably where it breaks the mold, right? Yep, agreed. Nice. All right, I think that was uh, helpful. Um, any other kind of things to say to this? So if anyone can find you or would be a good place? Oh yeah, great question. So if you are either trying to sell a business or you're looking for some help with, uh, and I should be specific, a physical e-commerce business. So yeah, what is the, that, uh, yeah, what's the specific, which yeah. are, is there a specific like a uh, set of criteria? So yeah, I had somebody that I said, well, you really would love this embroidering business. And I thought it was, it was a <laughs> nice thought, but I thought, no, I wouldn't love that at all. 
Yeah, so looking for a business that's doing over $100,000 a year in salary discretionary earnings that uh, is in a physical product direct to consumer space. So you can, um, you know, you need to have a customer list that you, you're selling directly to these folks. And uh, you know, it doesn't have to be your product. It could be drop shipping. I, l- I love exclusive agreements with manufacturers, um, even for a little bit larger business. And uh, you know, it's it's really great if you develop something. But I think that some kind of physical products e-commerce would be uh, what you should come to us with. Or if you're looking for help with your post-purchase checkout flow, so that uh, you can just check us out at scalexl.co. You can email me at lance at scalexl.co. Um, or you can come listen to our podcast. And, and actually, we had this great guest from Spark Shipping the other day <laughs> yes. uh, at leancommerce.co. Awesome. I will link to that in the show notes. So thank you for that. Um, <laughs> all right, Lance, it was great chatting with you. Yeah, you as well. Thank you.